I'm honored to be here today. And I just want to ask you one question. Have you ever had to have a conversation about lynching? Figured you did not. So um, I am the creator of the Lynch Quilt Project. I'm a facilitator of this project. And what I will say is that this project began the day I encountered this photograph, which is of Laura Nelson and her son, Lawrence, who died together May 25th, 1911 in Oklahoma. And the day I encountered this photograph, it's not as if I didn't know that black women and children had died through these heinous acts of violence. It's that the day that I encountered this photograph, it really became real for me. That it became a truth that wasn't something hidden in the dark. And so since 2003, I have been the facilitator of the Lynch Quilt Project, which is a community-based effort which explores the history and ramifications of racial violence through the textile tradition of quilting. And there are six quilts in this series, which each quilt exploring lynching from various perspectives. But for me, the obsession with lynching really began as I began to look at gender issues in lynching. And I had that photograph for a couple years, really trying to figure out what to do with it. And I knew that I needed to create an art form or use art or do something that honored it, but also looked at women and the aesthetic traditions associated with women, but also through the process of creation, allowed the individuals to come together to create the artwork. And so in time, that meant that quilting was the perfect solution to that dilemma. But there's just an additional dilemma. I am not a quilter. I'm actually a sculptor, so I had to spend about three months doing a lot of grassroots effort trying to locate a quilting group that was not only willing to teach me the fine art of quilting, but be willing to delve into this difficult conversation over and over again. And so the day I found them, it was about three months after doing some research, and I went to do a presentation to a group of about 100 quilters. And about 10 signed up, and we decided to meet again, and we came together, and the project in many ways began that day. But as time went on, it became very clear that just us 10 individuals were not enough to come together and really create this community conversation around such a difficult topic, that we had to find ways to bring more and more people to the table, to open the door, to have people willing to talk about this. And what began was a letter writing campaign to all manners of human rights organizations, social activist organizations, anti-racist organizations, other quilters, anyone we could possibly think of that be willing to join into this process. And as we got to that point, that was about early 2003. When spring came around, I started to get envelopes in the mail, packages in the mail. And after about three years ago, I just stopped counting. I had reached about 150 pounds of fabric, which really kind of broke down into about 20 laundry baskets. And I figured our outreach efforts to bring people to the table had worked. And some of these pieces of fabric are actually used in the quilts, which you can see here in this, her name is Laura Nelson, the white area of this quilt is all donated fabric. Other pieces of fabric become my favorites and get archived. For example, the baby bib where the mother wrote, my biracial son would have been one of those that was lynched or pieces of heirloom quilts that people take from their own family uh, heirlooms and send them to me. Others still go on to become a part of additional community-based projects such as this one, which is becoming the first in a series about an American masquerade tradition. And the entire canopy as well as some of the outfit is actually constructed from fabric that was donated specifically for the Lynch Quilt Project. But even as we began to expand the circle and bring more people in, how do we really make a change? And it's because we have to create additional activists, additional allies in the community, because it's not as if I can show up into your neighborhood and say, I'm here to do a project about lynching, want to join? It's not possible. What I can do is make allies and activists who go into their own community and become the activators for this discussion. And I want to talk about this artist, Marilyn Michelle Kunkel, who lives an hour outside of Portland, Oregon, in a town that's 99% white. It is a town that has a history of Ku Klux Klan activity, so much so that probably a few years ago, there were signposts put in the town that honored that tradition and that history. So for this woman to actually go out into her community and have the audacity to not only talk about lynching, but actually talk about how to heal this history was an act of pure courage. 
And so for the weeks and months that leading up into this project, which was entitled Performing the Lynch Quote Project, we spent hours upon hours each week talking about not only the history to prepare her with the facts and figures, but also her personal conviction as to why is she a white woman would have want to do this. And as I tried to prepare her that when you encounter the pain, the shame, the anger, the people who come to you and say, what are you doing here with that damn nigga quilt? How are you going to respond? Because really, there's only one shield you have in this situation, and it is half constructed from personal conviction, and the other half from historical truth. Other than that, there is no other shield against you and the public when you encounter this. So the day that she went to do this project, keep in mind we're three hours away. When I woke up in the morning, I had a three-page a three email, and it simply began with, this is a vex of a project, or should I say a hex of a project. But to her conviction, she continued on working in her community. She continued on with this grassroots effort, talking and discussing it with schools and the people in town. And all I could do was support her 3,000 miles away. And what I can say in about two years when all the quilts are completed and they get ready to travel around the country, that this small town in Oregon will be a place that the quilt, the quilt exhibition comes. So even as we begin to build our communities and we create activists and we do all that, what good is that if we don't share this information with children and to impact the future? Because the children are our future, and if we're unable or unwilling to have these really difficult and complex conversations with our children, then what are we doing? And so about in January 2013 of this year, her name was Laura Nelson, was actually on display at the main public library in downtown Indianapolis for a little over two months. To say that the conversations were difficult, that there was backlash, <laughs> that I was attacked is an understatement. And so when the quilt came down, I pretty much kind of went and hid at home for about a month, licking my own wounds. And when I finally came out into the community, I actually went to a community school where we went to talk about the project. And the conversation was fascinating. There were probably 12 kids between the ages of six to, uh, to seven and 16. The conversation was much more complex than I oftentimes encounter with adults. But the thing that they really wanted to do that I had never done was take the 105 comments that had been left at the library and divide them up. And so we found that a 68 were actually four and supportive of the quilt being at the library. 30 were really against, and there were about the seven or eight that were really kind of neutral. And they'd say things like, wow, I've never encountered anything like that. But it's not as if I didn't know that people really supported the project. It's just that until I saw this project through the eyes of children, I never really understood it. And that's why it's so important to take our passions and make sure that we impact the next generation and share them. But again, what good is doing any of this work if we don't know when to step back and let go? And so this brings us to quilt five, which is the most complex quilt in the entire series to try to take this graphic design image and re-engineer it into an actual piece of fabric. And so in the beginning of this project, I used to hold on really tight and then I, things would derail and I didn't know why. And then I went back to the core value of the project, which is that it's really about community. And the moment that I did that and held on to that tightly, the project began to expand and grow in so many fabulous ways. So about two months ago, I get a call from master quilter Otis Grove, who's been a part of the project these past, since 2003. And he said, well, you know, we're ready to get started. We need you to send the fabric and send the dimensions and send the pattern because we need to get going. And I hadn't been able to make it to Chicago so we could sit down and kind of Congress around this issue. So I started to make excuses. I was like, oh, I'm not ready yet. I haven't, I don't have the fabric. And he said, did I ask you that? So I stopped. He said, what I asked you to do is put it in the mail. Send us the fabric you have. Send us the pattern and the dimensions because we don't have time to wait on you anymore. We are ready to get started, and besides, we have all these fabulous new techniques that we want to try, and we need to get going. So I said, okay, we had our conversation. I hung up. I put in a mail that was two months ago. I've never looked back. And the reality is I'm okay with that, because sometime in spring 2013 or summer or somewhere around there, I'll open the door one day, and a beautiful quilt would have arrived, and the only thing that I would have done to it was to have the initial design and put a couple of pieces of fabric in it. And the reason that I'm able to step back and let go is because it doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to we, the community, we who have decided to come together and talk about this history. 
So when we think about making our communities, imagine what would happen if each one of us took our one passion and stepped into our community and had the courage to invite other people to the table, invite them to ask them for their help, to continue to bring more and more people to the discussion, continue to share our passions with children, and then be willing to step back and let go and let the community that we designed do what it was designed to do. Because if each of us were willing to do that with just one thing that was important to us, we would have the capacity to be the communities that we would like to see. Thank you.